Ladies and gentlemen, before you proceed to watch this video, make sure to watch as much of it as possible as it will greatly help me with the YouTube algorithm. And perhaps this video will eventually get recommended to more viewers. Even if you can't focus your attention to all of it, let the video play in the background or even put it on mute as I'm trying to reach to more people. However, I don't think that you will ever get bored, but I am not you. What's poppin'? Who you a Brand new whip, just hopped in. I got options. I can pass that bitch like stockin'. Just joshin'. What has lately caught my attention was the recently completed National Longitudinal Lesbian Family Study that was tracking the children who had grown up in lesbian families since 1986 where they had found out that in those lesbian families, 70% of females and 88% of males had identified as straight in comparison to 88% of females and 98% of males in the control group. Moreover, in the same study, it was reported that up to 54% of women and 33% of men had the same sex experience at some point of their life. And what was interesting is that it was celebrated with the author of the study, Nanette Gartel, a lesbian herself, had concluded her final remarks with saying this about her work. It challenges ancient stereotypes and fears that children would be psychologically harmed by growing up with same-sex parents and the vast majority would be gay themselves. These fears, she said, hold no water whatsoever. Oh, what sort of a fucking double thing is this, I ask myself. Of course, a majority of them will not be exclusively homosexual. The point is that non-heterosexual behavior would multiply, as the other studies pretty much reach the same conclusion. The current scientific literature states that the odds of kids growing up non-heterosexual in a homosexual family varies from 1.7 to 12.1 times more as opposed to in a straight family where the daughters of lesbians couples being 33 to 57% non-heterosexual, depending on the study. And this was the moment that got me thinking maybe I should make a video about non-heterosexuals and to what extent environment and genetics plays a role in it and most importantly their overall effects on society. Is it good or is it bad? In order to answer all of those questions, I had spent a big amount of my time researching it from all sides, so trigger warning for those potentially triggered, as this video will contain some amount of accurate information that may trigger you if you are a radical anti-LGBT person or a radical pro-LGBT person, as this video will be on page with the latest scientific data. So if you expect me to push non-heterosexuality saying that there is nothing wrong with it or saying that homosexuality can be cured by magic Christian therapy prayer, I must disappoint you, this video will not be of that nature. I guess I'll start this video by addressing whether homosexuality is genetic or not. And I hasten to upset the gay rights activists, because scientists could only explain 8-25% to of non-heterosexual behavior using genetics. Yes, that means that scientists could predict autism at a far better accuracy using genetics than non-heterosexuality, that is 80% compared to 8-25%. to However, if we look at twin studies, then autism is suddenly 90% heritable, in comparison to monozygotic twins seem to share 66% of sexual orientation with their other twin, while the zygotic twins happen to share 30% chance for that. However, this is the most highest estimate I could ever find and other studies report an even lower heritability. And what's also worth mentioning that in most of those studies, only exclusive homosexuality compared to exclusive heterosexuality was studied. Nowadays, bisexuality is far more prevalent than exclusive homosexuality. And finally, there is the physiological aspect to homosexuality that is also worth mentioning, particularly the difference in brain structure and other factors contributing to their development, such as hormones, 
and the order of birth in males, but for that I have to link you to another video that I actually enjoyed watching and that you can look for in the description, as I don't want to repeat all of the points he made with regards to the current scientific consensus on homosexual versus heterosexual physiology, and yes, as you can guess, this video pretty much ignored bisexuality, as do most sex researchers. However, as the amount of non-heterosexuals increases, I assume that twin studies will be less and less accurate in predicting non-heterosexual behavior and environment will play a larger and even more larger role even larger than it is now, and I would argue that now environment plays a significant contribution into adapting a non-heterosexual behavior and identity, and hopefully by the end of this video you will agree with me. But before that, it is important to apprehend the complexity of a sexual attraction that you can guess differs by sex. Men are more aroused by a gender of a sexual actor, while women are aroused primarily by sexual activities performed by actors. In the following study, it was found out that lesbian women's genital responses responded heavier when watching female-on-female -female sexual intercourse while straight women's genital responses did not discriminate based on sex, and responded equally to male and female sexual stimuli. Male genital responses, however, were consistent with their sexual orientation. You might naturally conclude that women are all naturally bisexual, but you would be wrong. Women simply get aroused differently and to many things, including situations, previous interactions and smell. It was not even the conclusion according to the study itself. You could also show a group sex scene and see that all women would be sexually aroused by that, but that won't mean that they are all suddenly polyamorous for the love of Jeremy Bentham. The cherry on the cake is that in the same study, strangely enough, it was also reported that women had responded genitally to bonobo copulation, although to a lesser extent, while men did not. Which is to say that men's and women's sexuality is very different, and especially when it comes to sexual fantasies and arousal. In a survey titled, What exactly is an unusual sexual fantasy? The extreme differences were that women had fantasized more of their own gender than men did, not to mention that 56% of them had fantasized about orgies involving people of different sexes, while only 16% of men did. On the other hand, 57% of men had fantasized about having sex with someone much younger, while only 18% of women had, which can be easily explained by the evolutionary theory since younger women are fertile women, but I have decided to study it even deeper and unfortunately there has been little research done on that topic, but here's what I've gathered. According to a research paper I found on Science Direct, 25% of adults men had the same amount of sexual arousal when looking at pedophilic material as they would look at adult sexual material. Another study directly taken from OkCupid data had found the same results, where men constantly chose the youngest female on the platform even as their age progressed, while women's preferred partner's age correlated strongly with their own, unlike men. For those of you who are shocked to find that, don't be, as if you look at history and cultures of primitive people, then those patterns of attraction will be easily identified by you, not to mention that it's perfectly explained by evolutionary psychology and exists in the animal kingdom, as attraction does not mean action, not to mention an entire identity. What, however, also stems from that is that sexual orientation has an effect on sexual attraction to minors. As Michael Bailey and Kevin Sue have found out that bisexuals are more likely to be attracted to children than heterosexuals, which is nothing new as it is a known fact that 33% of boys were molested by grown men, while in some places, <coughs> the Catholic Church, this number is even higher. And what's funny is that gay activists like to brush this little inconvenient fact aside by saying that either majority of male-on-male -male child molesters were married to their wives, therefore are heterosexuals somehow, 
or they say that homosexuality is defined as an attraction to the same sex, while pedophilia is defined by an attraction to minors regardless of sex, therefore you're wrong, bigot. Here's a paragraph that contains both of those fallacies taken from 1in6.com in an attempt to debunk the evil homophobes who point to a connection between non-heterosexuality and child molestation. Studies about this question suggest that men who have sexually abused a boy most often identify as heterosexuals and often are involved in adult heterosexual relationships at the time of abusive interaction. There is no indication that a gay man is more likely to engage in sexually abusive behavior than a straight man, and some studies even suggest that it is less likely. But sexual abuse is not a sexual relationship, it's an assault. The sexual orientation of the abusive person is not really relevant to the abusive interaction. A man who sexually abuses or exploits boys is not engaging in a homosexual interaction any more than a man who sexually abuses or exploits girls are engaging in heterosexual behavior. He is a deeply confused individual who for various reasons desires to sexually use or abuse a child and has acted on that desire. Whoa, so much damage control, and does somebody really buy into that? And for the confusion, men who have sex with men are not heterosexuals, sorry to say that, even though they identify as such on public and moreover, it's the matter of an abuse rate per capita that is relevant here. It should not be surprising to anyone, considering that the number of homosexuals that have had more than 4 sexual partners in the previous year is 31% compared to 11% of heterosexual men, in addition to 10% of them having more than 101 sexual partners in their lifetime, not even speaking of bisexual men who, according to National Gay Men's Sex Survey of 1998, 45% of them had sex with more than 5 male partners in last year, and yes, just male. What's also funny is that they claim that there hasn't really been enough of research on that topic, and that is certainly true, but the problem is that the same scum who is saying that is blocking every other possible research that is attempting to establish a clear link between sexual orientation and pedophilia, although most of the research that has been done so far does seem to indicate that, as research that does not usually looks at proclaimed sexual orientation of the offenders instead of determining their orientation by their sexual acts and not their personal identity, and at some point of time people will just need to accept reality. Alright, enough with that, let's talk about environmental factors of non-heterosexual behavior before finally jumping to their effects on society and individuals comprising it. As already they have mentioned, growing up in a same-sex family increases one chance of adopting this behavior as it is even often encouraged. Another thing that also increases a non-heterosexual sexual identity is definitely porn. I would assume that it would be relevant to mention, as the more amount of porn one consumes, the more they are likely to get exposed to this sort of behavior, be aroused by it, receive a positive reinforcement, and as a consequence, change their sexual orientation, because as we already know that sexual orientation is just a minimal same-sex attraction, right? A fairly recent survey from a porn site had reported that people who watch porn several times a day are only 61% heterosexuals, while people who watch porn once a week are 73% heterosexuals and I would assume that people who don't watch porn at all, the very minority of people I should say, are over 80% heterosexuals, but I don't have any data to prove that sadly. Another factor that increases non-heterosexuality is of course its rampant acceptance rate, and with it the number of people who are having sex with the same sex person. For instance, in 1973, the number of males engaged in homosexual activity was 4.5%, however, in 2014, 
it is 8.2% and I would assume this could increase potentially to around 33% as that was the percentage of men growing up in lesbian families. However, despite male-to-male -male sexual contact being for now probably at around 10%, they represent about two-thirds of all HIV cases. Interesting correlation, right? But I digressed. The most recent data on same-sex activity that I could find was from Spain of last year and and it pretty much looked like this. The constant bombardment of same-sex propaganda makes it very appealing to engage in this sort of behavior for a couple of reasons. First, it is seen as progressive, in other words, your overall status may increase as a result of this activity if you happen to live in a community that worships this sort of behavior, of course. Second, it will satisfy the certain sexual fantasies of some people, as up to 26% of males have had same-sex fantasies to a varying degree and about 59% of females in their lifetime. Not to mention the fact that accordingly with the recent study a category of completely heterosexual males were aroused more to male sexual stimuli than completely homosexual males were aroused by a female sexual stimuli. Which confirms the previous finding that exclusive homosexuals are really attracted to their own sex and not really attracted to the opposite sex with a slight exception of lesbians. What's again worth mentioning here is that with the right reinforcement and the right social pressures, the amount of same-sex activity would gradually increase even more than it is the case now, as for now the amount of exclusive heterosexuals among Generation Z, of which I happen to be a part of, is 48% compared to 78% of boomers. Another thing that is worth mentioning is that 28% of millennials, meaning that this percentage is way higher among Generation Z, are now cool with dating transgenders. I guess another point to think about. Also, what's not often talked about in the LGBTQ community is the rates of abuse and emotional trauma that cause persons to change their sexual orientation. Depending on the survey or a study, LGBT people report 3 to 5 times more sexual abuse than do heterosexuals. In a study by Steed and Templar, it was found out that 36% of LGB adults were once sexually molested before they reached the age of 16. Not to mention that half of the sample had admitted that it was what made their sexual orientation to change in the first place. Which is to say that at least 18% of LGB people changed their sexual orientation as a result of sexual abuse committed towards them. But those numbers are probably higher since it is a known fact that most of LGBTs don't believe that their sexuality was changed as a result of an abuse. Moreover, in a very recent study, it was reported that boys with a history of maltreatment were significantly more likely to be non-heterosexuals than boys without. What's also worth mentioning with regards to the environment is sexual fluidity or sexual flexibility. A similar word you may look for is gay until graduation or gay for the stay. In other words, the sexuality of a person changes as a result of the environment and the most common type of an environment that would cause this change to happen, at least temporarily, is porn and jail. In a 2001 female jail survey, the number of prior to incarceration lesbians and bisexuals was 36%. However, while in prison, that number had jumped to 44%, not to mention that those were people who referred to themselves as such, as for example in the same survey, 9% of straight women had already a same-sex experience before going to jail, so I would assume the amount of same-sex activity in the jail is probably around or at least 60%. Speaking of jails, it is also important to mention that the number of sexual minorities in jails is extremely overrepresented, as sexual minorities tend to commit more crime than do heterosexuals. However, it is not so simple. Bisexual men commit way more crimes than straight 
men, however, straight men commit more crimes than homosexual men. Strange, isn't it? With regards to women, lesbians were way more violent than straight women, because lesbians and bisexual women, just like bisexual men, are always more violent than their heterosexual counterparts. And that violence does not only occur in committing crimes or going into jail, but as you can see by this graph right here, happens in relationships. But more on the topic of sexual fluidity, it does not only change in extreme circumstances like in jail, but can occur during life due to exposure of certain hormones as well as the environment and the perception of self. In a six-year-old study of young adults with same-sex orientation by Sarah L. Katz Weiss and Hannah Hyde had reported that the sexual fluidity of their attraction to a certain sex was 50 to 63 percent fluid while their sexual identity was 34 to 48 percent fluid. Which is to say that bisexuality and perhaps situational homosexuality as well as some forms of homosexuality are fluid. And usually those types of transformations go only one way, from a less stable sexuality, that is bisexuality, into a more stable sexuality, that is either homosexuality or heterosexuality. For instance, with regards to those females who had their bisexual tendencies in their early 20s, almost all of them had adopted an exclusive heterosexual attraction by their late 20s. Which is to say that perhaps sometimes it is just a phase and it is especially and certainly a phase for bisexual females who are young as bisexual identity is the most unstable and fluid identity of all and likely won't last long. Heterosexual identity is on the other hand three times more stable for men and four times more stable for women with the most extreme conservative estimations. And since I had brought up sex sexual fluidity, I think it's also important to mention a few words with regards to gay conversion therapy. It seems to be not working on homosexuals, as those homosexuals who claim that they have been cured fail to prove that at lab tests. The best they can do is to repress their same-sex urges unlike bisexuals who seem to have their opposite sex responses strengthened, not to mention that bisexuality is the most fluid form of sexuality out there, meaning that it could go back to heterosexuality depending on the environment. So we have established that acceptance of sexual minorities and cultural values, especially when being adopted by a gay parent, situational homosexuality, sexual fluidity, abuse and emotional trauma, as well as porn consumption all predict at least a third of all homosexual behavior and at least two thirds of bisexual behavior if we were to estimate it roughly. Now let's talk about the most pressing topic of today, that is answering the question whether it is a good or a bad thing to have this large amount of sexual minorities as we do have now. A true conservative, not David Cameron type of conservative, would say of course it is a bad thing for our society, while a liberal lefty would say the exact opposite and would even add that we ought to increase the number of sexual minorities in our society as well as their representation literally everywhere. I personally align with the conservative position for the reasons I will mention rather shortly before I will mention the areas in which I will agree with the liberal. First, I think conversion therapy is not a workable solution for homosexuals and exclusive homosexuality is not really a matter of choice. I would also say that discrimination of homosexuals is not leading to their decrease or them changing their orientation or practices, not to speak of their suffering as a result, and I come to the conclusion that it is a waste of time to do so. I'm also also aware of the multitude of evidence that children of homosexuals do in school at around the same level as children of heterosexuals and unfortunately this is where the good stuff ends and the negative aspects when it comes to non-heterosexuality come into play. In addition to of course their already mentioned predisposition towards crime, molestation and being molested, promiscuity and in the case of trans women they are so sexually active that only 40% of them are monogamous which is pretty scary 
theory as polyamory for now is thankfully not that popular, although certain scum are trying to push it as another new sexuality, which again I don't really protest against as hopefully it will push more people away from this always increasing letter construction also known as the LGBTQQAI sorry I the fuck whatever. Unfortunately, unlike promiscuity, I could not find any studies on polyamory with regards to levels of depression they experience, as well as the quality of their marriages and etc. But I'm willing to bet money on it that it's going to be even worse than in promiscuity. And I'm not in any way surprised that it is transgender women that are very into this polyamory thing. And since I had mentioned marriages, yes, lesbian marriages suck, as they don't last very long unlike gay male marriages and straight marriages, but I assume partially it has to do with women than lesbians. But there is one point to mention with regards to gay relationships. 52% of gay and bisexual men had reported cheating on their partners. Also, it's very worth mentioning that according to homosexuals, anal sex was considered a form of cheating only in 79% of the cases, while blowjobs in 76% of the cases. So I just wanted to point that out here. I guess some people are really living this polyamorous dream, and the amount of cheating they do is probably higher than 65% knowing that. Moreover, a large amount of cheaters had contacted STIs, and more than a third of them did not even inform their partners of that. But maybe they just enjoy that lifestyle, who am I to judge, right? Or do they? According to mentalhelp.net, they are struggling with depression and mental illnesses. And funnily enough, those who are depressed the most are actually the groups that are supposed to be not oppressed the most in the LGBT community, bisexuals, that is, young bisexuals, as opposed to old male homosexuals, as one would assume, and even though homosexuality is accepted by around 85% of Gen Z Americans, 47% of bisexuals seem to be at risk of a depression, while straight population of their age is only 16% at a risk of depression. And don't get me wrong, the discrimination does indeed contribute to their overall depression rates, and more of that you can learn at healthyliferecovery.com, but it is also true that it happens at a far lesser rate than it was 20 years ago, let's say, or 40 years ago, but the depression rate doesn't seem to go away. What if I were to tell you that discrimination is not the biggest factor for them anymore? In a 2007 study when controlled for discrimination, the researchers had found out that LGBT individuals experienced more major discrimination and reported worse mental health than heterosexuals, but discrimination did not account for this disparity. Future research should explore additional forms of discrimination and additional stressors associated with minority sexual orientation that may account for the disparity. In a 2011 study, however, published by Cambridge University, finally revealed that missing link that last study could not report, and I quote, genetic factors accounted for a majority, that is 60% of the correlation between sexual orientation and depression. In addition, childhood sexual abuse and risky family environment were significant predictors of both sexual orientation and depression, further contributing to their correlation. Another study had confirmed a similar pattern and I quote, we found significant genetic correlation between sexual orientation and both neuroticism and psychoticism, but no corresponding environmental correlations suggesting that if there is a common cause for both non-heterosexuality and psychiatric vulnerability, it is likely to have a genetic basis rather than an environmental basis. So it seems that genetic factors in addition to discrimination and sexual abuse can predict higher levels of depression among LGBTQ individuals. I would also go and say that discrimination is surely not the biggest factor of a higher depression rate among Gen Z sexual minorities anymore, as it seems that no matter how accepting we are of them as a society, their depression just does not seem to go away. 
and it's due to several factors which include genetics as we have discussed, but also their lifestyles that I'm going to talk about now. In addition to their promiscuous behavior and increasingly polyamorous lifestyle, levels of crime, mental illnesses and abuse, they also happen to be drug addicts. According to addictioncenter.com, 20-30% of the LGBT community abuse substances while population as a whole does that at a rate of 9%. And let's not forget that population as a whole includes the LGBT community in it. Moreover, they are twice as likely to use tobacco than straight people, 3.5 times more likely to smoke marijuana, 9.5 times more likely to resort to heroin and 12.2 times more likely to use amphetamines. And of course discrimination does play a role to it and I don't deny that, but guess what? Discrimination plays no role in their promiscuous, infidel and polyamorous behavior and I would assume the usage of drugs is done for the same impulsive and let's have some fun reasons as their decision to be polyamorous and cheat on their partners. What's funny and sad at the same time is that the most engaged in drug usage people are the same let's have some fun people that are mostly heterosexuals, lesbians and bisexuals. In other words, people who have little self-control and would prefer to have short-term pleasures in favor of long-term gains and and stability. What's also worth mentioning is that literal pro-gay publications are advising bisexual and homosexual men to stop having so much sex, as a lot of HIV and other STDs were spread as a result of it. And it is time to say rather bluntly that bisexuals are just way hornier than any other sexuality, and their bisexual behavior could be possibly explained by that. In the male bisexuality study, those who ranked 2 to 3 on Kinsey score that is mostly heterosexuals and equally attracted to both sexes categories, had the most amount of genital arousal when viewing less arousing sex, and it should not surprise anyone that the more porn one watches, the more they are likely to become bisexual. And who watches porn? Right, those types of people. But here's the good news, you can work on your self-control, as most of LGBT people nowadays are not homosexuals, but are bisexuals or pansexuals, and objectively bisexuals cause way more damage to the fabric of our society than do homosexuals, as they engage in more promiscuous and infidel behaviors, drug abuse, crime, disease transmission than do heterosexuals, not speaking of the amount of suffering that bisexuals cause to themselves as their mental health statistics and suicide rate doesn't look too good. The problems with homosexuals of course exist too, but they are not as numerous as bisexuals Sexuals. However, they also bring a set of their own unique problems, that is a decrease in birth rates, disease transmissions, not stable marriages, speaking of bisexuals, polyamory, and most importantly, more bisexuals if they are to adopt children, which is probably the worst thing that they could possibly bring. Building on that, I'd like to say that having same-sex fantasies is very common with up to 26% of men and 59% of women reporting it, at highest estimates, at least to a minimal degree. However, with a heteronormative and monogamous culture, only a few of those people ever act on it, as they live in productive and stable environments, but once those taboos are gone, more mental illnesses, more crime, more depression, more divorces, more substance rate abuse, more degeneracy are coming our way. At this point, I don't even know what can possibly be worse. An increase in the amount of bisexuals, an increase in the amount of transgenders, which is literally infertility, an increase in acceptance of polyamory, an increase in acceptance of pedophilia, you name it, the stable foundations of our social and sexual culture are collapsing right in front of our eyes. And replaced with what exactly? Mental illnesses and pride in one's sexual orientation or even one's mental illness instead of one's country? How often do you see the younger generation putting their country's flag on their profile picture in comparison to LGBT, trans or some other wacky trendy flag? How could one imagine 
imagine that something as ridiculous as sexual preferences would once become not only an ideological identity that would trump the identity of their own people or country, but also a counter-identity that defines itself in opposition towards our way of life. How often do you see all those white LGBTQ people paying a tribute to their people, culture, religion, or even their country. Not very often, right? Instead, they pledge their loyalty to the LGBT ideology, making their identity dangerous for the society if we look at it through utilitarian lens. Let's face it, the LGBTQ movement is not willing to stop growing. It is willing to cock all the major corporations, as well as all members of our society, into conforming to them and supporting them over other people. This type of tribalism, I would argue, is plain stupid especially when it is branded in opposition towards what they call heteronormativity. If we look at it from a perspective of a group selection strategy, then this is incredibly damaging to our survival. Now, I'd like to focus your attention by making a very strong case with regards to monogamous heteronormativity. That will be in an ironic matter, but you should understand where I'm going with it. Marriage is still an oppressive institution. Yes, it did allow LGBTQ people to marry even though only like 10% of them are married as of 2017, but unfortunately most people are still oppressed. While 26% of men and 59% of women report same-sex fantasies to a varying degree, unfortunately a lot more people report polyamorous fantasies. Not to mention that 89% of people report fantasizing about having a threesome and I would also assume that if they were placed on a genital arousal test then at least 98% of people doing the test would be aroused by that. So why do we deny the existence of polyamorous people? For instance, a much more progressive Islamic countries do actually allow it to happen. They call it polygamy, of course, because they are patriarchal. <coughs> Sorry, they're not actually. Unlike Western liberal democracies that are discriminatory. In Guinea, for example, almost half of women are in polygamous marriages. And maybe we can learn from that, as that's what feminism is really all about. And thankfully, we are making progress, as the social attitudes towards polyamory improve with time, as more and more brave and stunning articles defending it are being published and it looks like someday we will become as progressive as Muslim countries with regards to polyamory at least. Alright, with that do you see where I'm going? Monogamous heteronormativity can be undermined pretty easily as people not only have same-sex fantasies but also polyamorous fantasies. Let's not forget that monogamy is only now is the norm, but that wasn't the case historically as it's not the case in other species. It is said that among mammals just 9% of species are monogamous, among primates just 29% and humans diverse lot. But before the evil western imperialism, 83% of indigenous societies were polygamous, 16% were monogamous and 1% polyandrous. This could easily be undermined with more sexual freedoms and people are pushing for it. And honestly speaking, there isn't really an element of homophobia in other animals as it exists in humans. It takes a special amount of intellect to come up with it as most of homophobia brought to the world was brought with the West. The West coming up with monogamy and enforcing it on other societies was an intellectual breakthrough of its own too, as it improved the social cohesion that still in the 2021 holds our society together. The most primitive and backwards people usually were the most sexually liberated historically. You can view it in the axis of order versus chaos, where the order symbolizes a repression of certain sexual urges of people, while chaos represents the result if those sexual urges were to come about. I would much rather prefer living in order. Finally, I'd like to show you another example of further sexual liberation, this time towards minor attracted persons, commonly known as pedophiles. For now, in the mainstream media, you can see the signs of pedophilia getting accepted as more and more people come off brave and stunning in defense of it, among which for now are TED Talks, The Independent and the BBC. 
while the American Psychological Association is yet to declare that pedophilia is in any way not a mental disorder as they did with homosexuality and transgenderism. Because unlike the previous one or two, pedophilia does not cause significant distress or disability to pedophiles unlike it does for transgenders. And yeah, pedophiles are also denied their right to existence because sex with underage person is prohibited, not even speaking of marriage, but yet again the Muslims are way ahead of us. So my ultimate thought for today is that heteronormativity is good, same-sex attraction is common and usually not dominant, unless one thinks of it around the same rate as of opposite sex or even higher. Bisexuality is not stable and can be put away with half of the cases. The rise of LGBTQ ideology and the amount of people identifying as such is terrible for our society for the reasons that I had mentioned previously. But most important it had allowed people to push the boundaries even further with potentially deconstructing the institution of marriage, sex or gender, that had probably already occurred, a return to polyamory, which in practice is really polygamy and perhaps even maximal sexual liberation coming with toleration of discord moderators, which all will lead us to even more terrible outcomes in comparison to those that we deal with now. Finally, I advise you to check all the sources for this video and to read an article about why straight women like to watch gay porn and societies without masturbation and homosexuality, as I wanted to mention them here, but the video was just too long, so I decided not to include them here. They will be in the description and they are pretty interesting. Also, I'd like to thank Ford Stage as he helped me to gather a third of my sources for this video, so you can go ahead and subscribe to him on Twitter, as well as to follow my Twitter, because I will be active on it. And for those of you who are still watching this video, I'd like to stress that I was not in any way advocating for the discrimination of homosexuals, nor I was advocating for conversion therapies for homosexuals in the form as they exist today. I was more talking about the social consequences of those behaviors being prevalent and why they are worse than heteronormative behaviors. And that was pretty much it for today. Thank you so much for watching.